On Tech News Today, the Apple iCard gets a ship date, the NSA has already hacked your phone's SIM card, and YouTube for Kids ships Monday. We've got amazing journalists from Mashable, Bloomberg, IDG, CNET, and Computer World, so stick around. Tech News Today is next. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Friday, February 20th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 50 plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And by Shutterstock.com. With over 46 million high quality stock photos, illustrations, vectors, and video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 20% off image subscription packages on your new account, go to Shutterstock.com and use the offer code TNT215. Tech News Today is a show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. I'm Mike Elgin, and joining me is Mashable Senior Tech Analyst, Christina Warren. How are you doing, Christina? I'm good. I'm good. I'm surviving the cold. That's the most important thing, I think. Survival <laughs> is key. And uh, you took an Uber today instead of the subway, you told me before the show, and I, I think that was a wise decision. That's probably why you're here now and not in the, one of those cartoon, like, ice cube things, you know, down on the subway somewhere. Indeed. I mean, have you guys, have you seen the, the photos of um, uh, Niagara Falls? Yes, yeah. Where Niagara Falls is frozen. I mean, no, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's the coldest day on record, apparently, in, in New York City, going all the way back to since they started taking temperature records in 1886 or something. It's it's ridiculously cold outside. Uh, it sounds horrible. Jeff Jarvis was one of our hosts on, on Twit, and he was uh, tweeting uh, the fear that his nose might fall off on the way to work today. Uh, he's also in New York. Now, Christina, you uh, posted something really funny on uh, Google+. Plus. Your husband sent you this really cool uh, video. Before you tell us about this, um, Jason, can you, we just play that video for just a sec? Uh, let's get a sense of what this video is all about. This is uh, some pretty wild cello playing. Check this out. All right, well, I'll have whatever they're having. Um, pretty pretty Seriously. wild stuff. Now, your husband sent this to you, and and what did, what was your reply? <laughs> so he sends me this video. I guess it was on Dig, and he was like, oh, check this out. This is awesome. And I was like, yeah, that was filmed at Mashable. <laughs> and so I think my Google Plus post was something like, the time your husband sends you a video, uh, sends a video to his wife uh, that was filmed in his wife's office. Yes. So this was actually something those two those two um, guys who are incredibly talented, uh, uh, two cellos, uh, came into the office and, and and filmed that for us. And uh, they're incredibly talented. And it was uh, it was just one of those funny internet moments where you know something is shared with you, and you're like, yep, I, I'm I'm aware of this. This actually happened where I work. <laughs> That's amazing. Sounds like the Mashable offices are are pretty exciting place, at least more exciting than your husband's workplace. Uh, apparently. Well, he works at the he works he works at the Daily Dot, which is also very oh, okay. exciting. But they're kind of remote, so the Daily Dot does great stuff, and he works from home a lot. So um, we we definitely have a bigger office that allows awesome things like that to happen. We didn't we weren't it wasn't always the case. It used to be you know hard for people to come in and do stuff, but now we have a great video studio. Then we can have uh, you know cello players and people like that in um, to do things. So. Well, uh, Christina, today is a special day at Tech News Today because today is our 1,000th, 200th episode, 1,200 episodes of Tech News Today. Uh, and uh, Jason uh, put a cake on this desk here, if you can see it here, right here. I see this. Yes. Oh, my God. 1,200 right. shows. After the show, I'm going to eat the entire thing by myself. And Good. we'll see if I slip into a diabetic coma. So. So okay, well, well you take some insulin, get, get an insulin pump okay. ready, okay. just in case. Insulin and pump. Uh, no, you got, uh, yeah, totally, And but no, you got to enjoy it. Congratulations, 1,200 shows. It's oh, my God. Congratulations, insane. Tech News Today. It is insane. <clears throat> we have a, a rabidly enthusiastic audience, uh, as you see in our uh, How You Watch TNT pictures. We even have a uh, studio audience here today. You came in the right day. We have cake, apparently. <laughs> All right, well, why don't we go ahead and do the news. Will they or won't they? 
everybody wants to know if Apple is serious about building a car. Now Bloomberg's Tim Higgins reports that Apple plans to ship a car as early as 2020. That's in just five years. Tim joins us now to talk about his exclusive. How are you doing, Tim? I'm well, thank you. Now, what are your sources telling you about this 2020 target? Is this pretty solid or is this kind of a loosey-goosey, uh, uh, wishful thinking kind of a target? Well, Apple, um, as you know, works on a lot of projects. Uh, they, they're always exploring things, and they have a they have a history of, of 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 looking into things and then deciding not to do it or to delay it. Um, so you know, it's as soon as 2020. It really underscores, however, the kind of the effort that, that they are doing. I mean, they are they are hiring at least they have about a 200 people already hired in the auto space. They may be hiring more. They're looking to get beef up on their expertise in the automotive industry. Um, and so it is definitely something that they are working on at the moment. Now, what do you think that Apple can bring to the electric car market that someone like Tesla or, or even GM can't? What's, what's their big advantage, do you think, um, in, in approaching this space? Well, it, it, it gets to the Apple strategy of uh, trying to make their devices the center of the user's digital um, world. And if you look, um, you know, look at the car space at this point, that nobody's really cracked that, uh, cracked that nut. And so, you know, it's it's appealing probably to a company like Apple, thinking that they could uh, bring their user experience, um, their expertise in computing, their expertise in um, industrial design, um, those sort of things. Um, it, you know, they're not the first company to to look at the car and say, hey, there's a huge potential here in the amount of time that people spend. Um, you know, this is kind of the untapped market. Now, it was refreshing to read your report because, of course, there's a lot of chatter around this uh, Apple iCar that uh, Apple may or may not be building, and a lot of it is around the hiring. Uh, can you give us a sense of, of the sort of uh, circumstantial evidence or the evidence around who Apple is hiring, what kind of people Apple is hiring around this project? Yeah, we we had an interview with uh, Elon Musk um, a while ago, and he uh, told us that uh, Apple was being very aggressive trying to recruit his folks offering $250,000 signing bonuses and, and promises of increasing their pay dramatically. Um, you know, so it's on one spectrum. And then you look at uh, a lawsuit filed this month uh, by a battery maker called A123 um, with accusations that Apple was poaching um, their workers. You, you start to look at some of the, the folks that are, that are showing up there from other automakers um, and, and suppliers, and you start to see kind of the outlines uh, of, of kind of the expertise that they are going after, folks with battery experience, robotics. Um, uh, you could go down the list. Now, it's, it's interesting you, you mentioned um, Tesla, and obviously it seems like Apple and Tesla have kind of been having a war trading employees back and forth. But a lot of people have wondered, and, and I've even kind of wondered this glibly, why Apple just didn't buy Tesla. Uh, was this a, an idea, do you think, that was ever even raised, or is this something Apple even considered? Well, there's a lot of speculation a while back ago that, that they would. Uh, you know, the, the, one of the largest acquisitions that Apple has made in its history was, uh, was the Beats uh, headphones company um, last year, which was so unusual because of the size of it and, and whatnot. Um, you know, Apple, if you look at it, they tend to, to go out when they make acquisitions, they buy some expertise that they bring it in. You, you, I think of um, some of the things they did to build uh, iTunes and that sort of thing. Um, you know, Tesla... It also, its shares, its stock value has just skyrocketed in the last few years. Um, you know, that could uh, potentially be a reason why they have fallen out of, of some companies' acquisition targets. Tim Higgins is at Bloomberg.com. You can follow him on Twitter at Tim K. Higgins. Thanks for joining us today, Tim. Thank you. The Edward Snowden trove of leaks is still producing mind-blowing information. Now we've learned that the NSA and the UK's GCHQ have given themselves the ability to monitor much of the world's mobile phone activity by hacking SIM cards. Grant Gross is the Washington correspondent for the IDG News Service, and he joins us now. Welcome to you, Grant. Thanks for having me. Now, the leak revolves around the products of a company called Jamalto. What is Jamalto exactly, and what is their product, and how did these spy agencies hack it? Well, Jamalto does a lot of things, but one of the things they, one of their primary businesses is uh, making SIM cards for for 400 odd um, uh, mobile phone carriers across the globe. And so, the report is that um, NSA and GCHQ hacked into their um, network and uh, compromised their encryption on on their SIM cards, which would allow them to uh, intercept traffic going over phones on those SIM cards. 
Now, let's talk about the scale here. You know, um, how many SIM cards do you think we're talking about? You mentioned about 450 mobile carriers. Uh, who does this include? And and um, how many cards, um, do you th- uh, Jamalto cards, do you think are out there that, that could potentially be, have been compromised? Um, well, uh, all the big carriers in the U.S., like AT&T, Verizon, and uh, Sprint, use uh, Jamalto SIM cards in some of their phones. Um, Jamalto does about... 2 billion SIM cards a year that they put out. And so we're talking a scale of of billions of cards. Um, It's not clear so far how many uh, cards that the spy agencies targeted and um, how kind of big the program was that, that, that um, they used, that they used to uh, uh, steal this encryption information. So it's unclear of the size of the program at this point. Grant, what is Jamalto doing about this news? Are they taking any action or have they made any uh, comments publicly? They've made some comments. They, they were unaware that they had been, they had been hacked. Um, uh, uh, and they're, they're looking into it at this point. They, they were pretty surprised by the reports that, that they had been hacked. And weren't we all? Grant Gross is at IDG.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at Grant Gross. Thanks for joining us, Grant. Sure. Th- sure thing. Google plans to launch a free new Android app called YouTube Kids on Monday. Ben Fox Rubin is a tech reporter for CNET and joins us to talk about this. How are you doing, Ben? Good. How are you? Doing great. Thank you. Now, is this just a front end to YouTube? Is there any exclusive kids content involved? Um, I know there's Reading Rainbow. That might be a little bit different, <laughs> but um, it's probably a bit of a repackaging. But the thing is, for parents, it's a really good way to kind of narrow down the millions and millions of videos that are already on YouTube to give them something that's a little safer and a little bit easier to just kind of throw at their kids uh, without having to worry that they're going to see something a little bit more suggestive or vulgar or what have you. So even if it doesn't have new original content or much of it, I think it would still be valuable for parents to use. So what can you tell us about the interface? Is this designed for small kids? Is this designed kind of for, you know, kids um, of of a lot of assorted ages? Are they going to see ads? Uh, What can you tell us about that? I don't know if there are going to be ads on this. And um, Google tends to come out with uh, different platforms and different packages and then kind of figures out how to monetize them afterwards if they do become successful and build enough of a critical mass. So they didn't really talk about advertising at this point, but it, it looks like it is targeted at um, uh, like pretty young kids. The uh, icons are significantly bigger than you might see on a tablet or a regular website so that little fingers can get to it. And um, it's very, very simplified. So arguably, if, if you wanted to, you could throw this at a, um, a four-year-old or a five-year-old. I mean, I have a two-year-old, and she knows how to tap and swipe, so she could probably end up using this too. Can you tell us a bit about the parental controls? What, uh, what options do parents have? Um, a couple really helpful options, I would say. One of them is to turn the sound off, which I would say is super helpful. Another yeah. one is that uh, you'd be able to, at some point, Um, just the app will turn itself off. So you could set it for half an hour, 45 minutes, or even 10 minutes and say, you know, that's, that's basically it. And in in a sense, then the parent doesn't have to be the bad guy. You could just basically tell the kid, oh, the the app did it. Um, (laughs) Blame Larry Page. It's, it's, I I think that they were at least trying to be pretty thoughtful about what parents want. Um, So uh, the turning off the app, I think is really helpful there's also the search button. The search is um, really specific where if you would kind of search for suggestive terms like sex or something like that, it, it would just say, why don't you try searching for something else? So even if somebody, even if a kid tried to do it unintentionally, it's really just trying to redirect uh, a young child to something else that's a little bit more age appropriate. So it, it sounds like they did um, think through a couple of things for uh, kids that are under 10 that could potentially use this. So final question, and this is the most important question. When is the iOS version shipping? <laughs> no idea. And it would, be, it would be interesting if they decided to just not do iOS at all and just try to push more people toward Android. I, I doubt that that would happen just because if it's successful, they want to get it on iOS too. And obviously there are a lot of Google apps that are already on iOS. So hopefully for somebody that has an iPhone like me, um, it, it will show up on iOS sometime soon. Oh, it, I'm certain it will. I mean, there's just, you know, 
uh, parents whose kids have iPhones <laughs> have have a lot of money, and so they're not going to give that up just to push Android. And and of course, Google is always very very good, uh, oftentimes shipping the iOS version of their apps before the Android version. Ben Fox Rubin is at CNET.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at Ben Fox Rubin. Thanks for joining us again, Ben. Much thanks. Yahoo CEO Marissa Meyer yesterday proclaimed that Yahoo is now a mobile-first company and unveiled a new mobile development suite. Matt Weinberger is a reporter for Computer World and wrote about this story. Welcome to you, Matt. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being here. Now, barely half of Yahoo's users and just one quarter of Yahoo's revenues come from mobile. So why is Meyer saying that Yahoo is a mobile-first company? Well, because it's kind of an investment in the future, right? Yahoo's moment has kind of passed. When Yahoo first started, it was hard to use the internet. That's not necessarily as true as it once was. So if a quarter of its revenue comes from mobile now, that's going to creep up and up and up. And Yahoo's trying to head that off at the pass a little bit. So what will this mobile development suite uh, let developers do? What are, is this really just mo mostly about ads and about you know analytics? Or, or what, what is it really going to let developers do that they couldn't do before? Um, what they couldn't do before, that's that, that, that's the wrong way to think about it. It's what they could do easily because what you do is you build in these tools. It has a suite called Flurry um, that lets app developers see who's using their app and how. Uh, and what that does is let them match ads better, get, get more targeted ads, get more specific ads for the audiences that they already have. And with these other tools, it lets them use things like Comscore to validate their audiences, see who their demographics really are, it's kind of a match made in heaven because Yahoo has this amazing advertising business. Maybe not as amazing as once it, as once it was, but still pretty amazing. This is just letting developers build that stuff into their own apps. Now, can, can you talk a bit about Yahoo App Publishing? What is this and how would people use it? So Yahoo App Publishing lets, uh, would let uh, users or developers rather match inbound uh, apps, rather get inbound users by advertising their apps. Uh, so you get to, so you get to have ads built in. It's almost like iAds on iOS devices. It lets you put ads directly into your apps, make money off of them. Yahoo takes a cut, of course, but it means that your free app is now making you a little bit of money every month. That's cool. All right. Well, Matt Weinberger is at computerworld.com and you can follow him on Twitter at M underscore wine, W I E N. Thank you so much for joining us, Matt. Thanks for having me. All right. We got some follows for you, but first let's talk about ZipRecruiter, the way to hire great people. You don't want ungreat people. You don't want uh, the wrong candidates. You want the right and best candidate for whatever job you're hiring. That's really the secret to success is to surround yourself with the right people, hire the right people, and ZipRecruiter is a way to do that. You can post your job to 50-plus job sites with a single click, and that includes Facebook, Google+, and Twitter. ZipRecruiter's premium traffic boost is a really cool new feature, and you can get you up to three times more candidates. It gives you a huge, huge advantage. And, of course, ZipRecruiter also goes out to social networks. You can quickly screen applicants. You can rate them fast. You can hire them fast. And you can find out why ZipRecruiter has been used by more than 200,000 businesses. One of the greatest things about ZipRecruiter is you can add unlimited users to your account. So if your organization is hiring, obviously you're not going to be hiring people all by yourself in most cases. Uh, every time I've done hiring, there's at least five, six, seven people involved. And with, uh, with uh, ZipRecruiter, you can have unlimited users. That means if you have a hundred people who are involved in the hiring process, they can all pile in and be involved and have access to all the all the stuff, and it's the same price. There's it's just unlimited uh, users uh, for your account. You can also use the embeddable job widget and add your list of job openings to your own company website, which is really the right way to do it. So right now, our listeners and viewers can try ZipRecruiter for free. Plus, get thirty percent off your first traffic boost by going to ZipRecruiter.com/tnt. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of Tech News Today. Well, 9 to 5 Mac is reporting that Apple is building a dedicated display area for the Apple Watch at some upscale French retail stores, including Galleries Lafayette and Champs Elysees. The Post also reports that Apple's thinking about building dedicated Apple Watch retail stores. Christina Warren, have they gone crazy? They're they're already building <laughs> safes and special cases in Apple stores. Okay, that makes sense. But now they're talking about um, possibly building dedicated Apple Watch retail stores. That's amazing. 
You know, I think that it makes sense if you think about the context of this really being a luxury jewelry item. You know, there are Cartier stores, there are Rolex stores. And, uh, uh, you know, they, the person who's now in charge of retail at Apple is Angela Arendt, who did a fantastic job as Burberry's CEO. And Burberry has proven that you can have, especially in Europe and in Asia, uh, these individual, you know, high-end luxury retail stores that can be dedicated to certain purposes. So I think that Maybe they're not huge uh, stores, but if you have small places, especially in certain markets and in certain neighborhoods where this really makes sense, um, if you don't want to deal with all the other stuff, you just want to go in and either take a look at an Apple Watch or maybe you know get another band or or you know drop down the the rumored you know ten grand is what some people are thinking that that uh, the the gold watch edition might be. Um, it might be an awesome way to to kind of really show that off and really prove that Apple is not just making a, a technology device, but is making a, a true accessory and a true piece of jewelry. Fess up, Christina Warren. Which one are you going to get? I, I can't afford the, the the gold one as much as I would like that. So I'm probably just going to wind up with the uh, with the basic <laughs> sport watch. Yeah, the sport one at least will have sapphire, The and it'll probably be, you know, more durable. It will, probably won't look quite as good, but... Uh, but it'll be probably better yeah. for working out running and stuff like that. So that's probably the one I'll get. And, and, and that'll probably be the one that I'm hoping that there will be a, a huge aftermarket of, of, of a third party, yeah. you know, uh, watch um, uh, bands and, and I can get something Kate Spade or, or something like that to, to accessorize it well. All right. Well, I uh, can't wait to, for that thing to come out. I just can't <laughs> wait to see what the actual thing is. All we've seen so far is a little canned video that they had running on it. So we'll, I, I can't wait to see the real thing. Well, we got some product updates for you. BlackBerry updated its BlackBerry 10 OS to enable BlackBerry devices to use Android apps from the Amazon App Store. And they also added other enhancements. 9 to 5 Mac says Apple plans to launch the first ever public beta program for iOS. The company's mobile operating systems didn't, didn't used to have public betas, but they probably needed them. Uh, recent releases were criticized for being buggy, so this is probably a very good thing. And we can expect the final version of iOS 9 uh, in June at their developers' conference. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I guess that operating systems, the law of entr entropy uh, dictates that they become, you know, software becomes more complex over time, Christina Warren. But it just seems like every new iOS release is buggier and more problematic than the last. No, that's true. And and they usually do work themselves out uh, fairly quickly. And, and if you're part of their developer program, uh, you can actually, you know, they release betas fairly frequently. And oftentimes the betas are, are fairly stable. I, what I'm interested in this time, you know, it's one thing to have a beta program, the beta C program for OS 10. And you can kind of explain to people, you know, this is the, the realities of running beta software. Things might not, you know, be, uh, you might not want to put this in a mission critical device. It takes a little bit of time to install stuff. But I do wonder, if they do a beta program for iOS, you know, how they're going to basically inform users that, hey, you know, sometimes stuff might happen and might not be right and we're going to need you to, to report bugs um, without users freaking out about it. My, my hope would be that they make it hard enough to a certain level to opt into it so that the only people who are actually using the public betas are people that understand the risks going with it. But I do feel, I, I'm with you, you know, the the quality, especially at the 1.0 place when these new releases are coming out, um, has, has been getting buggier and buggier. And I do think that a good way to combat some of that would be to open it up to more people and get more actual user feedback rather than just developers and the people working at Apple. Kind of a funny thing. Uh, uh, on this show so far, uh, Christina Warren, I've seen four people walk by that have been guests on the show. <laughs> so kind of funny. I, I guess if uh, one of their stories pops up, maybe you can just reach out and grab one and drag them in. All right. Well, we've got some product <laughs> obituaries for you. Kevin Rose's North Technologies recently launched a video and photo sharing app called Tiny. That's Tiny with two eyes. But now the app is shutting down, sadly. North co-founder Mark Hemian said that uh, Tiny was a fun experiment, but ultimately the users have told us it's not a strong enough product to replace their existing ways of sharing photos and videos, i.e., Twitter, Vine, Instagram, et cetera, and Facebook, of course. Snapchat. Snapchat, thank you. And in Hack Attack news, the U.S. State Department confirmed that hackers breached its unclassified email system three months ago, but now the Wall Street Journal is reporting that those hackers are still in the system. They're still accessing the email system, and the government has still not figured out how to keep them out, even with help from the NSA and outside contractors. Christina Warren, uh, what a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm sorry. I don't mean to laugh, but it is funny. Um, no, I, I, it's what a nightmare indeed, but it's 
How does this even happen? You know, I mean, honestly, you would think that if any department that would be able to afford the best person to secure their email server would be the, the State Department. So how how does this even happen that they that their setup is, is so bad or that they, they have so many holes that they they can't even outside contractors in the NSA can't even keep them out? To me, that almost makes me wonder, is this this the hacker, somebody on the inside who's who's, you know, purposely opening up holes after things are patched? I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm a conspiracy theorist. I don't know. I think it's Joe Biden personally. <laughs> So, he's getting too close again, right? Exactly. He's, he's, now he's getting he's, he's getting too, too close, close to the mail server. <laughs> he is. He's getting too close to that mail server. He's just crowding in on it. He's just going, ooh, that's right. I'm app. Yeah. Why, why do you think he, why do you think he's smiling all the time? He knows everything. <laughs> all right. In he's like, I know your secrets. <laughs> exactly. Uh, in government crackdown news, Russia's antitrust authority today officially opened a case against Google. We saw this coming. The company's being accused by its biggest Russian rival, Yandex of violating Russia's anti-monopoly law by bundling Google Search with Android. How dare they, Christina Warren? How dare they? Have Google Search in Android. Wow. Those viola how, how, how antitrust violating people. Terrible. All right. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. Ugh. It, it's they're, they're sort of like the Microsoft of our age, I guess, bundling. But I, nobody cares about bundling, especially on mobile you know, operating systems. They, every mobile operating system has apps that provide you access to services for, you know that they uh, you know provide and in fact that's the whole point well, of Android right. Android well Exactly. I mean, the whole thing is also we saw what happened with Microsoft. You like we, we tried to the Department of Justice tried to sue them. Nothing happened. The EU put sanctions. Nothing really happened. And, and we kind of learned our lesson. We're like, you know what? This is going to happen anyway. So just the, say la vie. Yandex should just fork Android and come out with its own Yandexy version and, and just sell that to all the Russian, you know, mobile carriers. And, and if, if that's really the game they want to play. I'm really actually surprised and, and impressed that Yandex has a 40 percent market sh market share on on Android. 40%. I mean, you know, that's a, that's amazing competing against Google. It's very yeah. difficult in most markets to compete against Google. And if you look in Europe, you know, I, I think that uh, alternatives to Google search on any platform are always in one digits. They are. And, and I mean, it, absolutely. So I, I'm with you. I mean, if they're able to already have 40 percent and that's without it being pre-installed, to me, that kind of violates the monopoly argument a little bit. Uh, but then again, I, I don't live in Russia and um, I'm not coming at it from their perspective. So now we'll see how that where that goes. And in hiring, firing and poaching news, the invitation only social network Ello, remember Ello, uh, which promised to never show ads on the site or ever sell user data, just hired its first chief marketing officer. It's not clear what he'll market. The CMO is Rene Algria, <laughs> who used to work at HarperCollins before founding a site for Hispanic mothers called Mommyverse. In related news, Ello plans to open to the public in about a month and also release a mobile app. Christina Warren, does anybody uh, use Ello anymore? There was a brief blip where they were the alternative that, you know, everybody was talking about and everybody thought, well, maybe they're going to be a, a big social network. And I haven't seen a lot of activity, but what do you think? And no, I haven't seen a lot of activity either. I mean, it was fun for like a couple of days and it was kind of a fun joke. Um, and then we all went back to Twitter and Facebook. You know, when I became concerned about LO was when my mother-in-law, who's 74 years old, asked me for an LO invite. And wow. then I and it, her, her her rationale was actually pretty smart. She was like, "There are too many old people on Facebook," um, <laughs> and so at that point, uh, she you know she's a character and she's fantastic. She's amazing. But at that point, I was kind of like, it had become so publicized, you know, all over the news and whatnot. I was th thinking, you know, whatever, th this is now just a fad. It's going to be hard for them to grow this into an actual network, especially when it had such an oversized amount of hype and publicity. Th th to be fair to them, they didn't really ask for um, out the gate. It's going to be hard for them, I think, to actually turn this into a real network and, and not um, just, a, you know, a, the, the butt of a joke at this point. I think it's hilarious that your grandmother is leaving Facebook for the same reason that 15-year-olds leave Facebook. Uh, too many old people. All right, we've got some big numbers for you. 5.9 million. That's how many additional German homes Deutsche Telekom plans to upgrade to its VDSL network, which will offer download speeds of up to 100 megabits per second. If you feel horrible about that living in the United States, if you live in the United States, then, uh, yeah, you should. Uh, we're getting yep. further and further behind 100 megabits per second is a good, that's a good minimum, I think, that we should all uh, aspire to and, and press our carriers for, although it's going to be a long time before we all have it. All right, in, in news you can lose, a new Android-powered projector called Beam lets you stream what's on your phone from its Android or iOS app. The project casts a 854 by 480 resolution screen with 100 lumen brightness on any surface you point it at, but... 
beam does an amazing trick. It screws into any standard light bulb, uh, light bulb socket. So by screwing it into a lamp or pointing and pointing that lamp at the wall or a table, you get the projection. Now, Beam is being crowdfunded on Kickstarter and should ship in October. And here comes the video. Go to turn up the sound. You can turn any surface into a big smart screen, allowing you to do whatever you want. You can place Beam above your dining table and play some games with your buddies. It also comes with reassuring banjo music. This is pretty cool, Christina <laughs> yes. Warren. I, I think this is a great idea because, of course, a lot of people oh, have a, a light, you know, a sort of a desk light that's pointed down at the desk. The surface of the of the desk or a table is a great place for a, a display unfortunately it's not you, you if you touch the table nothing will happen it doesn't have any sort of right. feedback mechanism but still you can display things you can watch uh, movies you can keep an eye on a screen or whatever i think this is a really innovative cool idea no i think it's genius and i love the fact that you know it works with with um android and ios so you can just fling content to it and, and beam it over because not only i mean a it would be just a cool projector design if that's all it was but the fact that it then has that connected element with your phone which is how you're wanting to see content most of the time anyway you know you've got it on your phone and your tablet uh, i think this is really really smart so good on them and uh uh, I, I, I'm uh, looking forward to seeing this once it uh, leaves its its Kickstarter phase. Me too. I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna invest in this one and see if I can get an early. Same. Early. same. I think I have to back this. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, we got some uh, more information for you in just a sec. But first, let's talk about Shutterstock. It's the uh, it's the stock photo site that I have been using for a long, long time. I absolutely love it. They have 48 million high quality stock photo photos, illustrations, vectors, and vectors, video clips. I mostly use the stock photos for blogging, mostly. But of course, you can use it for all kinds of projects in advertising, for publishing things for your website. Uh, you want to grab some videos for your video, just little bits of video. One of the great things about Shutterstock is, of course, you know, there's some projects that you want that super professional looking stock photo style of photo. But sometimes you don't like when you're doing a blog, you don't want the you don't want the kind of photo that shows people who obviously don't work in a specific office that isn't really an office uh, gathered around a screen sort of pointing artificially, that, that kind of thing. That's great for certain types of content, for advertising, for lots of things. But for your blog, you want more natural, more, more realistic looking photos. And Shutterstock has millions of these kinds of photos. No matter what you search for in Shutterstock, you're going to find every type, every style of a photo, which is really, really great if you're a blogger uh, like me or you do uh, all kinds of uh, other projects that require photography. And of course, you have to be visual or nobody's going to pay any attention to you on the internet. The internet is now a rad radically visual medium. Shutterstock adds 300,000 new images every single week. So there's always fresh new stuff that nobody has ever used on Shutterstock. And of course, they have flexible pricing. You can have individual image, image packs that you can buy, or you can sign up for a monthly subscription. If you, for example, download 25 images a day with a standard subscription, that would probably uh, be plenty of images and photos for you to use. That's the one we use at Twit, and we all have access to it, and we can never get anywhere near that 25 image a day maximum. No credit card needed. Just start an account now and begin using Shutterstock to help imagine what your next project could be like and save some favorite images to a light box to review later. Once you decide to purchase, use offer code TNT215 and new accounts will get 20% off image subscription packages. That's Shutterstock.com is for 20% off image subscription packages on new accounts. Use offer code TNT215. All right, well, our TNT fan of the day is Michael Mooney in Miami, Florida, who posted these pictures on Twitter and said that he watches tech news today while his puppy is sleeping. It's really adorable. Check this out. There's the puppy. Aww. Yeah. And there <laughs> is the... Oh. Yes. There's, there's you, Mike. And there's you. Oh! <laughs> oh, his puppy's so cute. Yep. And there oh. it is. Very, very cool. How do you watch or listen to TNT? Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook. And use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT, and we will find it. Christina Warren, what are you doing besides trying not to freeze to death? What are you up to? <laughs> well, actually, Mashable is about to have a, a Mash Talk um, and just uh, starting at uh, 2 o'clock Eastern uh, where we're going to be debating all of the Apple Car rumors and, and all the Apple Watch rumors and everything else. And so myself and Lance Ulanoff are going to face off on the Apple Car. Uh, we, we agree more than we disagree, but we're probably going to hype it up for the cameras a little bit. So that's what I've got going on this afternoon. And then just, uh, just more just stories kind of cranking out, getting ready for a lot of big news next week. 
That's wonderful. I can't wait to see that. And uh, yes, you you and Lance probably have uh, a lot uh, of your views in common, but I know both of you, and I'm sure you'll find plenty of areas of disagreement, and that should be a really uh, interesting debate. Absolutely. It's, it's going to be a fun debate. It's going to be fun. All right. Can't wait to see that. All right, Christina, thank you so much. We'll see you next week. See you next week, Mike. All right. You can subscribe to Tech News Today on Feedly, or you can browse our many options for subscribing at twit.tv slash TNT. You can also watch us live every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC at live.twit.tv, or on the app or browser plugin of your choice. Just go to twit.tv slash apps to see all the ways to watch Tech News Today. If you're ever in Northern California, come on in and watch us live. You can follow us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV, and you can follow me personally on Vine. That's vine.co slash mike.elgin. Also, don't miss Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific every weeknight. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you Monday.